Hi everyone, we are now going to review two of the problems from chapter 10. The first being P1030A. So we have here, disc, and this is on page 582 of your book. Discount parking near an airport and call the, incurred the following costs to acquire land, make land improvements, construct and furnish a small building. What we need to do is identify which asset each of these expenditures would be charged to land, land improvements, building, and furniture. And you can see the answers are already there, but let's take a look at each one. The purchase price of three acres of land would definitely go into the land account. But remember, when we are purchasing assets, we just don't debit the asset account for the purchase price, but all costs to get it ready for its first use. So in B, when a discount pays delinquent real estate taxes on the land, that's actually part of the cost of the land. They have to pay those in order to purchase the land. Additional dirt and earth moving, although you may think is a land improvement, it is not for our purposes. It is part of the land cost. Land improvements are assets, are actual separate assets that are on or in the land that will deteriorate over time. And we'll be taking a look at those. Title insurance on the land acquisition. So this is an insurance policy on the title. So if there's any kind of problems in the future related to the title, it's covered by an insurance policy. Well, the premiums on this are part of the cost of the land. It's necessary to purchase the land. How about a fence around the boundary? Well, now this is a land improvement. This is a separate asset on or in the land that will deteriorate over time. The building permit for the building is part of the building costs that's necessary to construct the building, so it will be identified in that asset. Architects are necessary for designing and uh, designing the building, so that's part of the cost of acquiring the building. Signs near the front of the property are a separate asset on or in the land, so they are a land improvement. The cost of the building materials, part of the building. The cost of the building, of the, uh, the cost of the construction labor to build the building, part of the building. Interest on a construction loan while building the building. That's part of the building cost. So if you're not familiar with that, a construction loan is, um, let's say you, you're this company, discount parking, and you go to the bank and say, we like to borrow money to construct a building. Well, they're gonna ask you for your information from your contractor, of course, how much it's gonna cost in total and how much you wanna borrow. And then, you know, if everything is okay, they'll agree to it. Well, they just don't cut you a check for the amount you wanna borrow that day. What they do is they say, start constructing it. And as you finish, we will send you some of the proceeds from the loan um, so maybe after you're 25% done, they'll have an inspector come out, verify that you're 25% complete with the construction and send you 25% of your loan. Well, during construction and you're receiving these loan proceeds, you will be paying interest only on the balance of what you borrow. Well, while you're paying interest, on this construction loan during construction that's debited to the building account. It's part of the cost of the building. Once the building is complete and you convert the construction loan to a mortgage, any interest payments would then be considered interest expense. Parking lots are considered land improvements. Again, an asset on or in the land that will deteriorate over time. Lights for the parking lots, also land improvements. So we get a feel for what these land improvements are. Now, when we have the salary of the construction supervisor, total of 50 grand, he spends 80% of his time at the building site, 20% on the land improvements for the parking lot and concrete walks. Then we will split his salary as such, debiting those assets for the time he spent completing those. Okay, so the furniture obviously goes in the furniture asset account.
but also any transportation of furniture from the seller to our building will be in the furniture account. Any additional fencing is categorized in land improvements. So you can see that the total balance of the land account is a lot more than just the purchase price, 98,500. The land improvements accounts for all those assets that are on or in the land, 75,200. The building, 461,100, and the furniture, 13,400. So when these expenditures were happening, those are the accounts that would be debited, and then cash or accounts payable would be credited for the items. Okay, so that is how we categorize these expenditures. In requirement two, they ask us to complete the depreciation. Now remember, depreciation, all it is, is the expensing of a property, plants, and equipment asset over its life. So over the years, we will use it because it deteriorates over time. Land is not expensed. It doesn't deteriorate like a building or furniture or the fence or the sidewalk. Okay, so we will calculate how much of each of those assets, the land improvements, the building, and the furniture were, quote, used up. And we do that based on a formula and a method. And this company uses straight line to calculate the amount to expense of each of these assets. Now, they define the useful lives of the land improvements as 15 years. That's how long they'll last. The building will last 40 years and the furniture 10 years, and they have no residual value. Well, from your reading and the videos, you know straight line is calculated, formula driven, cost of the asset minus the residual value, so the salvage value, divided by useful life, how long we're going to use it. And that useful life is going to be consistently the same each year. So we don't change it. We don't go, oh, there's 14 years left or 13 years. No, we're using it 15 years. That will give us the amount of depreciation for each year for those 15 years. We have a little issue with our first year here because the assets were not placed into service in requirement two until October 1st. So, you know, we were constructing them during the year. October 1st is when we officially started using them. So the first year, you're only going to need to expense three months of the 12 months. So for instance, land improvements. We'll take the total cost we just de determined, 75,200, no residual value, divided by 15 years. That gives us our annual amount of depreciation expense. But since we only have used it put it into service for three of the 12 months, only $1,253 is the actual dollar amount. Same calculation for building. Take the total cost of 461,100, no residual value, divided by the life of 40 years. That's the annual amount of depreciation expense on the building. That's how much of the building we expense each year. But we only want to expense three of those 12 months this first year. 2,882, and then finally the furniture cost is 13,400 from above, no residual value, 10 year life. The annual amount would be 1340. We only need to calculate though three twelfths for that first year or $335. So that's how we calculate the depreciation for the first year using straight line. The second part says do the journal entry, and here it is. We debit depreciation expense, land improvements. Remember, that's an expense account. And credit our contra asset, accumulated depreciation land improvements. And remember, that will we'll have the land improvements on our balance sheet has a cost of 75200 right? And then we'll have less accumulated depreciation 1,253 in the first year. The building, debit depreciation expense building, credit the contra asset for the building account, accumulated depreciation building, and you do the final one with the furniture. So we could see how we determine the cost of an asset, one way of calculating depreciation, 
to the journal entry that records it. And remember, depreciation journal entry is an adjusting journal entry, right? We learned this back in chapter three. We're just showing you the various ways of calculating that dollar amount for your journal entry. And that's what we're gonna be going to next in 1031A. In 1031A, we have here January 3rd, 2018, so the very beginning of January, Rapid Delivery purchased a truck at a cost of $100,000. Before placing it in service, they spent $3,000 to paint it, $600 to replace the tires, and $10,400 for an overhaul of the engine. So we're going to stop right there. So the total cost of the truck is $114,000 because they did all those things to get it ready for its first use. Okay, so you got to, don't forget to do that. Don't forget to add those additional amounts to get it ready for its first use. It then goes on to tell us they expect it to have a five-year life, so that's its estimated life, and it will have a residual or salvage value at the end of the, the five years of $12,000. Remember, for our purposes, the company determines the life of the truck and the salvage value. That's all their estimate. And just as long as it's reasonable, it's allowed. They also define the life in terms of how many miles they'll drive it. They expect to drive it a total of 136,000 miles. The general manager asks you to create depreciation schedules for each of the different methods so you could decide how should we record depreciation expense. So let's take a look at the first method straight line. Now, as I said, this is formula driven. Your author loves tables though. So we're going to follow along with his tables, but essentially, or hers, I should say, the cost of this asset is 114,000. When it comes to straight line, remember in our numerator, cost minus residual value. That's our first thing we do, 102,000 divided by the life in terms of years. In this case, they multiplied it by one-fifth. It's the same as dividing it by five. So each year, your annual depreciation expense is the same, 20,400. Notice the life of the asset does not change and you don't keep recalculating. No, it's a five-year life, you just use five. So each year, this company will be debiting depreciation expense, and crediting accumulated depreciation. So in the first year, the depreciation expense amount and the accumulated are gonna be the same because there was no depreciation before today. So now that account will have a balance in it. After this journal entry is posted into accumulated depreciation, you could then determine the book value. The book value is the cost of the asset that we would show on the balance sheet minus the balance of accumulated depreciation or 93,600. The second year, we're going to debit depreciation expense again, credit accumulated. When we do that, now accumulated is at $40,800 balance. That's the balance of the account. So the new book value will be the cost of the asset minus the new balance in accumulated depreciation for 73,200. The next year, same amount, same journal entry at the end of 2020. Debit depreciation expense, credit accumulated. When we credit the accumulated, the balance will now increase to 61,200. Cost of 114,000 minus 61,200 new balance in accumulated depreciation gives us a book value at the end of year three of 52,800. We go through that same process for year four and you could see how accumulated increases, book value decreases. And finally, year five, the last year we're expensing this vehicle. Now, that doesn't mean we stop driving it at the year, end of year five and go, whoop, we've recorded all the depreciation expense, got to stop driving this thing. No, we estimated that we would drive it for five years. But if you could keep driving it, keep driving it. This just tells us 
no more depreciation expense. You've expensed what you said you were going to use of this vehicle's cost. Now, if you're sitting there going, yeah, but there's still a book value there of 12 grand. Yes, because we said that's what the salvage value will be at the end of the life of the asset. So one very, very important thing to remember is that book value, this calculation in our last column, cost minus the balance of the accumulated depreciation, book value must always be greater than and at its lowest amount equal to residual value. It could never be less than residual value. So straight line, most companies use this for their financial statements because it's pretty straightforward and it's always the same dollar amount each year, very predictable. I'm gonna take a timeout, not that you know that, but I need to take Okay, guys, so the next method we're going to look at is called units of production. Remember, it's still the same cost, 114,000. Residual value is 12. Now, in this method, we don't measure the life of the asset in terms of years. We define it in terms of some unit that we could track on the asset. So we could um, define find the life of a truck in terms of how many miles we'll drive it. But a piece of equipment, it could be how many hours we're going to use it or how many coffee cups it's going to make. Okay, so not all assets can use units of production, but this is another method available when you could define the life in something other than years. So the very first calculation we do, and it is a two-step process, is we calculate our depreciation per unit. And once we calculate that for the asset, that's it. So we take the cost of the asset minus the residual value and then divide that by the total miles we're going to drive it. Now, once you divide that out, it'll tell you how much this truck depreciation expense should be per mile. So how do we calculate the total depreciation for the year? We need to determine the total number of miles each year. Now, in reality, we would just track that each year. But in our theory world, they tell us in the problem, they're going to drive at 32,000 miles each year for the first four years and then 8,000 miles in the final year to equal 136,000 miles. And that's the key. We stop recording depreciation expense on this when we reach 136,000 miles. So for the first year, we'll take 75 cents times 32,000 miles. $24,000 is our depreciation expense. That's how much we would debit depreciation expense, credit accumulated depreciation. So now we have a balance in accumulated depreciation. We'll take the cost of the asset minus the balance of accumulated depreciation of 24,000, book value at the end of year one, $90,000. Now, the reality is we wouldn't probably consistently drive this 32,000 miles every year, okay? But our theory world, that's what we're pretending. So 75 cents per mile, year two drove at 32,000 miles, again, 24,000 depreciation expense. Debit depreciation expense, 24,000. Credit accumulated. When you credit that accumulated account, the new balance in it will be $48,000. Last year's 24 plus this year's 24. Cost 114,000 minus the 48,000. Balance of accumulated depreciation gives us a book value of 66,000. As you can see, our book value is well above our residual value of 12 grand. So we would do this computation each year, adding the new amount of depreciation expense into the accumulated depreciation account, because that's just how our journal entry is. It would automatically increase the balance in accumulated depreciation. So this schedule in front of us does not take the place of our journal entries or our T accounts. It's just showing us 
how to get the dollar amount, and the ultimate impact there will be on our T account accumulated depreciation. The final year, when we only drive at 8,000 miles, 75 cents times 8,000 miles, 6,000 is your depreciation expense. This would um, lead to a total accumulated depreciation of 102,000. Cost 114 minus 102 gives us our book value of 12, which is equal to our residual value. So we stop recording depreciation expense on this asset. We may still continue to use it, but this part of the process is done. Now, our final method is double declining balance. It's a little different and it's used primarily when we're preparing our taxes. And yes, you can depreciate an asset one way for your financial statements and another way to do your taxes. It's okay, it's not breaking the law. Um, and if you're an accounting major, eventually in your four year program, you will learn how to pull that all together but just know that you can do that. So double declining balance is a little different, okay? Here, instead of using cost minus residual value, we take book value of our asset at the beginning of each year. So what's the book value of our asset at the beginning of 2018? Cost, 114, no accumulated depreciation, so the book value is 114,000. So you can see here in our first calculation, that's what we use. We then multiply it by the number two over the life. So the fraction would be the numerator's two, the denominator is the life of the asset in terms of years. So two fifths. So 114,000 times two fifths, depreciation expense in the first year is 45,600. You're still gonna do your journal entry, debit depreciation expense, credit accumulated depreciation, but it will be for 45,600. That will now create a balance in accumulated depreciation. Cost of the asset, 114,000, minus 45,600, book value is 68,400. Now, one thing to notice in this method, nowhere in our calculation did we subtract residual value like we did in the other two. So a very important part of this method is we're always cognizant of book value. Is it going below our residual value? Obviously, in the beginning of the life of the asset, it's still very high. You haven't expensed much of it, but that will change as we get later in the life of the asset. So let's go and calculate year two's depreciation. Use the beginning of 2019's book value. Well, that's at 68,400 times two fifths. So depreciation expense, 27,360 for year two. I know you're probably sick of hearing it, but we'll debit depreciation expense in our journal entry credit accumulated depreciation. So we're adding the 27,360 to this 45,600. Gives us a new balance in accumulated of $72,960. Now what's our book value? Cost of the asset, 114, minus the new balance in accumulated depreciation, gives us a balance, a book value of $41,040. Take a breather, right? We continue the process into the third year. 41,040 book value as at the beginning of 2020 times two fifths gives us 16,416 depreciation for 2020. Create our journal entry, which would then increase our accumulated from 72,960 up to 89,376 because we would have added that 16,416 to the balance. Now our book value is at 24,624. So we are getting closer to the 12,000 residual. 2021, start with the beginning of the year's book value times two fifths. The amount of depreciation is 98.50. Add that, because we'll do our journal entry, 
which would increase accumulated to 99,226. Now our book value is at 14,774, dangerously close to our residual value. Now watch what happens. You still do your computation. You go into 2022 going 14,774, my newest book value, times two fifths. Hey, yay, yay. Didn't mean to do that. Two fifths. Now, when you do that computation, and I'm not going to put the dollar amount in here, but if you take 14,774 times two fifths, you're going to get $5,910. If you recorded all $5,910 of the computation as depreciation expense, your accumulated would have went from 99,226 up to 105,136. Now, if your accumulated depreciation is at 105,136, subtract that from the cost of 114. Your book value is at $8,864. And we told you that can happen. Book value can never be less than residual value. So in a year when your calculation causes you to have too much in depreciation expense, say, okay, where's my book value at now? 14,774. Where does it need to be at? 12,000. Take the difference between the two, and that's how much an additional depreciation expense you record. So we plug it to make it work. Because if we did the calculation, it wouldn't work. It would be too much. So when we record debit depreciation expense, credit accumulated depreciation for the 2774, now our book value is at 12 grand. Okay, so those are just three methods, actually five or six different methods that we have to choose from. We just show you the most common ones out there. Straight line, take the cost of the asset minus residual value and divide it by the life of the asset. That life is consistent. Same amount of depreciation expense will be recorded each year. Units of production, little different approach. We take cost minus residual, but we divide it by the life in terms of total use uh, within a unit. Could be miles, hours, output, it depends. Get a depreciation per unit, in this case, 75 cents per mile. Then multiply that by the actual miles each year to get your dollar amount of depreciation expense. Finally, with double declining balance, a different approach where we take the book value of the asset as of the beginning of the year, multiply it by the number two over the life of the asset, and record depreciation expense until residual book value equals residual value. Three different methods, three different results. So the question comes, what do we use? Well, Rapid prepares financial statements using the depreciation method that reports the highest net income in the early years of asset use. So we need to look at the first years. In the first year, straight line, the amount of depreciation expense is 20,400, very low. For units of production, it's a little higher at 24,000. Take a look at double declining balance, $45,600 twice, two and a half times almost, the straight line amount. So depending on your financial objective will determine which method you use. For rapid delivery, they will use straight line because that results in the highest net income in the early life of the asset. Okay, so that is um, our review problems for Chapter 10. If you have any kind of questions, please post them to the discussion board.